All right, good morning. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this session of Admitted Students Day and welcome to Harris. I'm Alex Carr, Director of Operations at the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts. And I'm excited today to introduce our speaker, Professor James Robinson. James Robinson is the Institute Director of the Pearson Institute and the Reverend Dr. Richard L. Pearson Professor of Global Conflict Studies in the Harris School of Public Policy and the Department of Political Science. He is also a university professor, a designation held by only 10 faculty members across the University of Chicago. Professor Robinson is a political scientist and economist whose work focuses on political and economic development and the factors that are the root causes of conflict and explores the underlying relationship between poverty and the institutions of a society. His research is regionally diverse with a particular focus on Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa. He is the co-author with Daron Asmoglu of the international bestseller, Why Nations Fail, The Origins of Power, Prosperity, and Poverty, which has been translated into 40 languages since its publication in 2012. His most recent book, also with Asmoglu, is The Narrow Corridor, States, Societies, and the Fate of Liberty, which examines the question of how liberty flourishes in some states, but falls to authoritarianism or anarchy in others. At Harris, Professor Robinson teaches the course Economics, Politics, and African Societies, jointly with Professor Raul Sanchez de la Sierra. You'll have a chance to take this course when you join us here at Harris, as it is open to master's students. So today we have the great opportunity to hear about some of the latest research Professor Robinson has been working on. If you have questions regarding the presentation, you'll have a chance to ask at the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, if you have administrative questions regarding the Pearson Institute, please feel free to email me directly and I'll drop my email in the chat. So with that, I will turn it over to him. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Professor Robinson. All right, thanks very much. Yes, good morning, everybody, or good evening, or good afternoon, or whatever time it is in where you are in the Zoom, Zoom, Zoom reality. Okay, good. So let me um, let me get on with this. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what I'm going to do. Uh, view. Uh, so this is hmm. okay. I was trying to I was trying to put it on slideshow, but I didn't didn't succeed. Oh, here we go. Slideshow. No. Okay. Okay, that worked better. All right. Can you see that? Okay, good. So, so, so as Alex was saying, uh, um, I've worked a lot for many years in uh, in Latin America, in Colombia. I'm working a lot in Bolivia at the moment uh, with a Bolivian friend of mine, and but I've also worked for a long, long time in different parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, and I've taught classes on African politics and society and African economics. And this uh, this paper with Soren Hen, who's a student of mine from Harvard, who's a postdoc at um, at Chicago at the moment at the Harris School is really a sort of attempt to reflect on prospects for African development and and you know sort of surprising prospects you could say and I you know many people write about reasons to be optimistic about Africa or Africa has been you know so challenged economically uh, since independence and uh, you know now with the rise of China, with the economic rise of China and India, the the majority of the world's poor people are actually in sub-Saharan Africa for the first time. So, but every time I read somebody writing about you know why one should be optimistic about African development, I always think, no, that's that's not the reason. <laughs> so, so this article, this this pro there is a paper. It's on my web page. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. But if you're in, if you find it interesting, you can read more. Uh, this this paper is a sort of attempt to to, to to identify based on you know Soren works a lot in he's also lived in Malawi he's worked a lot in the DRC and Rwanda so this is this is comes out of a conversation a long conversation to try to identify okay what is it what you know what is it about Africa that should really make you optimistic about its future economic prosperity that's what this project is about and here's one way of sort of motivating it which is to say, think about China. You know, if we went back to the middle of the 1970s, uh, China was one of the poorest, uh, most technologically backward countries in the world. And 
and it has had a terrible 200 years. You know, by the second half of the 18th century, the Qing, Qing state was falling to pieces, the fiscal state was falling to pieces. By the early 19th century, the Grand Canal had silted up. The granary system of famine relief, one of the great kind of achievements of the Qing state, collapsed. There was enormous amount of civil war and violence in the 19th century. The imperial state collapsed. There was warlordism, a communist revolution. There was the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution. You know, so China had had this absolutely disastrous span of, uh, of development, you could say, lasting for 200 years, one kind of calamity after another. Who could possibly have predicted that this would turn into, you know, the world's most successful experience of rapid, rapid economic growth. So there's never been an experience of rapid of growth so rapid as China has experienced in the last 40 years. So how would you possibly have anticipated that in the middle of the 1970s? I think the over, I don't know if Chinese people anticipated it, but the overwhelming evidence is that Western scholars did not anticipate it. And in fact, Western scholars would have been able to point at all sorts of problems in China with the institutions, problems with the judiciary, problems with law, corporate law. There would have been all sorts of reasons why, why what happened could never have happened. So I'm start, just to start by saying surprising things have happened in world economic history, okay? And how do you understand that? How would you understand why it was that China was able to be so successful so improbably? And I think the way that we think about it is to say, well, despite all the problems, there were some, some aspects about Chinese society, and we're going to call those latent assets. There were some things that were inherent in Chinese society, which were extremely synergetic with rapid capitalist development. And here's one example. I could talk more about this, but let me just give you one example, which is going to be relevant for discussing Africa, which is this notion of meritocracy. OK, this very deeply seated people talk a lot about corruption in China, but honestly, I've always been much more impressed by this, this norm of meritocracy. It's very deeply rooted. You know, Confucius talks about it. He says, you know, in the Analects, promote those who are worthy and talented. But actually, it seems to go back before this. Yuri Pines, who's a, a sort of historian of uh, ancient China, claims that you know, this notion of meritocracy actually antedates uh, Confucius, okay? And you know, think about it, you know, China was the one part of the pre-modern world that had an elite that passed an examination system, okay? We didn't have that in England. You know, we didn't really have an examination system in England to get into the state until after 1848. So, so, you know, so, so, so and I guess the point here is, wow, that becomes evident ex post. It was there in 1978, you know, it wasn't working. But when Deng Xiaoping started changing some things, this latent asset, you know, engaged and, 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 and was an incredible motor of entrepreneurship and innovation. OK, so just so so the starting point of this essay is to sort of say, OK, so let's let's make an analogy to this Chinese situation and say Africa hasn't had a terrible 200 years you know, it might have had a terrible 500 years you know it's almost uh it's 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 uh it's as it's about 500 years ago you know when the portuguese induced the kingdom of the congo in in central africa to start selling slaves uh just over 500 years ago okay and if you think about that pit that epoch of the ramping up of the slave trade uh colonization the post-colonial, the Cold War, you know, the propping up of dictators, the, you know, there's been a long series of shocks in the same way that China had. You know, there's been state failure, there's been civil war and violence, there's been falling levels of income per capita, and you know, predatory outsiders, you know, predatory outsiders, what about the Chinese? You know, the, the Chinese had to put up with the British selling, you know, the, bit, the British were the first international drug runners, you know, selling them opium. Uh, so, you know, so like, think about it. It's, you know, it's the same sort of thing. So, so then, so Africa's had this, so could, but could it be, could it be that despite all of that, just as in China, there's these latent assets in Africa. And, and the point of this paper and this project is to say, actually, yes, 
And here's three arguments and a lot of data to back them up. So the first argument is a very sociological one. It's related to the Chinese uh, discussion of meritocracy. So of course, there isn't examination-based civil service or elite uh, in Africa. But African society, at least in my own personal experience, there's variation here. We discussed the variation in the paper, but let me not get into nuance too much in a half an hour talk. But, but, but what's always impressed me is the achievement basis of African society. African society is very achievement based. Anyone can get to the top. You don't have these kind of hierarchies and caste systems. And it's a sort of free for all and, and talent Talent is always respected and, and talent can always get to the top. Okay. So, so that I, you know, I find I've that's my based on my personal experience in Africa. And I'd say, you know, that's the same sort of sociological advantage that China had. Okay, I'm going to show you some data in a minute. I'm just kind of introducing these three arguments. The second argument is that, again, this is sort of based on my own personal experience, uh, is Africans are extremely cosmopolitan, you know, African, at the time of the scramble for Africa and the colonization of Africa, Africa was divided into several thousand polities, you know, African political society was small scale, you don't really see these large bureaucratized states like you see in Eurasia. So political society was small scale, there was enormous linguistic and cultural heterogeneity. But there was trade, there was migration, the Africans are used to dealing with these incredibly heterogeneous societies. They're used to speaking and talking to people in different languages, different cultures. You know, Africa is the most multilingual part of the world. So this notion of cosmopolitan, actually this comes from a Ghanaian uh, political philosopher, uh, uh, Appiah, Kenneth Appiah at Princeton, but, but he uses it in a normative sense. We're gonna use this as in a positive sense, is that you know, Africans are the most cosmopolitan people in the world. They're just used to dealing with different cultures and different languages and different people. They're not like the English, you know, I'm English. So well, look what the English do. The English can't even stand the French after all these years. You know, they wanna get out and like build a big fence and, you know, and, and go to the pub. And, uh, you know, it's like, that sort of attitude doesn't equip you for coping with this globalized world that we're living in. But Africans don't think like that. So, 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 so the idea here is that, you know, Africans are, are, are by far the best equipped people in the world to deal with this globalized uh, world. And, and one of my colleagues here, Kath Catherine Kinsler, who's a social psychologist, has actually written a lot about what she calls the, mul the multilingual advantage that being multilingual is is an enormous advantage uh, cognitively and uh, psychologically the last uh the last latent asset you know is what we call skepticism of power you know what do i mean by that i mean you know if you look at the history of the united states and the, U the u.s constitutional process it was sort of imbued with this incredible skepticism of power you know authority is going to be abused you know john locke's second treatise of government when he talks about the creation of the state, he sort of says, yeah, but who's, who's gonna be running the state? You know, like some crook. I mean, how, how do you know that person is gonna, he doesn't say crook actually, you know, but he, he, he thought it, you know. Uh, well, who's gonna be running that? And how do we know they're gonna work in the interests of the people? So African oral history and African political theory is very similar. It's just, it's through and through. It's all about this enormous skepticism of, uh, power people in power are going to abuse it i find that you know that's very different from different in different parts of the world you know the mexican historian enrique krauser has a book called redeemers which is a, it's a great book about the history of latin america and he tells the history of latin america around the figures of what he calls these redeemers you know latin americans are always looking for redeemers you know people to save them look at look at mexico at the moment you know like there's all this corruption how are we going to solve all these problems in mexico we're going to vote amlo into power and amlo we're just going to let him do anything he wants you know and he's going to save us we're going to chavez we're going to put chavez in power he's going to save us we're going to put peron in power he's going to save us you know so so but that's a, that's kind of unthinkable in africa you know in africa you may get stuck with a dictator, 
but but no one's in favor of that and nobody think well some people are in favor of it if you're in his network you know you might be in favor of it but the average person is sort of deeply skeptical there's no kind of charismatic populism in Africa and I guess our argument here is that you know if you thought about the U.S. experience that actually turns out to be a powerful norm in some sense for building states that work in the interests of society and of course again this is very different from the East Asian or Confucian traditions of authority and you know where there's no notion of you know there's how does how, you know how does that work you know how how do people in power govern in the interests of society well through cultivating virtue you know through practicing ritual and finding the way not a not a concept in in africa okay so 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 that's the idea and then most of the paper is kind of bringing evidence to bear on these three latent assets and i say you know we use the word latent so that's significant in the same way you know i talked about the chinese case which is to say meritocracy all these other principles in china were latent because they couldn't really manifest themselves in successful economic development without some bits of bad governance being el eliminated you know deng xiaoping had to kind of make some reforms not not that many you know that's what's interesting what it's not you he, deng xiaoping didn't solve all the institutional problems and they haven't been solved today in china but he solved enough so that this principle could sort of engage. And I think that's an interesting way of thinking about Africa also, because that means Africa doesn't have to, sure, there's lots of problems of governance and institutions in Africa, but you don't have to solve all of them for these things to engage. And so that's, that's, that's I think that's important. All right, so let me talk a little bit about some of the data. Okay, so, you know, like, achievement-based, African society is achievement-based, you know, how, how do I know that? You know, how, 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 how do I know that? Okay, well, let's look at some data on social mobility. Okay. Uh, one thing that economists have studied a lot is, you know, if it's going to manifest itself anywhere, it's going to be in, in terms of uh, social mobility. All right. So what do I mean by social mobility? How would I measure social mobility? Well, the way economists look, look at this is to sort of ask, you know, if I, if I know something about your parents' income or your parents' level of education, to what extent does that predict your income or your level of education? So in a society which was kind of socially mobile, there'd be very little predictive content in your parents' income or education for your income or education. But in a society which is very immobile, then, then somehow, you know, whatever your parents were like, you'd be like. Whatever their income was, that would be your income. If you're poor, if they're poor, you're going to be poor. If they're an elite and rich, you're going to be an elite and rich. That's a sort of rigid uh, society, okay? So what would be an example of that? Well, what about Latin America, okay? So, so let me, you know, this is data from the Latino Barometro. On the horizontal axis is a, you know, this is an, inc is an income scale. And people are asked, you know, where's your parents? Put your parents on this income scale, okay, from one to 10. And then on the vertical axis is your position on this income scale, all right? So, so an immobile society would have all the data on the 45 degree line. So, so each of these circles here plots, you know, a number of observations. The bigger the circle, the more observations. So the fact that you see these big circles are all clustered on, on the 45 degree line, you know, is exactly a situation of immobility. It's where your parents' income predicts your income. Okay, that's, that's Latin America. You know, that's, you know, if you read the social science literature about Latin America, you know, if you read Why Nations Fail about why Latin America is different from North America, this is a deeply rooted story of institutions and hierarchy and inequality, very persistent levels of inequality and the relative lack of social mobility. So that's what you see, okay? So what do you see in Africa? Something totally different, okay? So if I plot the same type of picture in Sub-Saharan Africa, this is data from the Afrobarometer, which is not, it's not one to 10, it's zero to 10, but it's the same thing. On the horizontal axis is the parent's position, on the vertical axis is your position. You can see that far more data is off the 45 degree line, okay? That's just a way of measuring 
social mobility in some sense that some needs not i'll show you a statistic but 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 in a loose way you can say a society which is more mobile is going to have more data off the 45 degree line people are moving around poor people are becoming rich rich people are becoming poor okay so for example in latin america in the latino barometro 53% of re respondents are sort of basically on the on the 45 degree line you know they 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 say that you know they report the same economic score as their parents 50 52% of them in that in africa that's only 20 20 20.5% okay and in fact what's really amazing about this social mobility data is that africa is the most if you compare if you look at comparable surveys in East in Asia, or here's the, the United States. In fact, Africa is more socially mobile than the United States or anywhere else in the world, according to this data. Who would have guessed that? Okay, so, so, so that's, you know, that this is okay, but this is this, you could say, if you were a skeptical economist, you'd say, well, this is reported income and reported. What about actual? Well, you know, uh, I could come to that. But here's something even more interesting before I come to that, which is the Afrobarometer and other, other, other surveys ask about your children. You know, what do you expect? So I reported my income, I reported my parents' income. What do you expect for your children? Okay. What's incredible is how in optimistic Africans are. You know, here's Latin America at the top. What do Latin Americans expect for their children? Same, same old thing, you know, same old thing. The data's on the 45 degree line. You, you know, you expect your children, you're poor, you expect your children to be poor, you're rich, you expect your children to be rich. Same old story. What about Africa? Africa are ludicrously optimistic. Africans are ludic ludicrously optimistic. Why, how, how, you know, how could that, how could that be? You know, how could it be? And, and, and is it all like self-deluded or something? I don't know the answer to that. We're, we're, I think, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I've never seen anyone look at this data before, even though it's publicly available. Uh, so we're, we're, I think this is something we're going to try, we're trying to investigate. But let me just say one thing about the academic literature on this topic, which is that uh, all the scholars who've worked on this show that there tends to, people's beliefs about social mobility tend to be out of equilibrium with actual social mobility. So for in, in the United States in particular, uh, people are much more optimistic about social mobility for their children than is realistic given you know observed patterns of social mobility but it turns out that actually matters because your expectations influence your behavior that they influence your decisions you know your saving behavior the extent of investment in education of your children the way you vote you know your preferences over public policy so the expectations you might say aren't those expectations out of equilibrium you know they might be but but the evidence suggests that's actually quite common and it actually matters in an interesting way for public policy. So, so even if Africans are overly optimistic given the circumstances, that turns out to be interesting. That's my point. Let, let, let me, I'm not gonna get into observed mobility. Let me, okay, so there's one very surprising thing. You didn't know that, okay? And I didn't know it before I started looking at the data. I kind of, I sort of sensed it, but, but, but I didn't know it was so systematic. Here's another thing, okay. So the World Value Survey, this one is maybe even more surprising. The World Value Survey asks all over the world people questions like, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm my, I can't see the slides, I'm manipulating my, here we go, all right. So uh, the World Value Survey asks respondents to choose between, in the long run, hard work usually brings a better life on one end, or Hard work doesn't generally bring success. It's more a matter of luck and connections. Okay, so there's a scale from one to 10. On one end, you know, hard work pays off. On the other end, hard work, waste of time. It's all a matter of luck and connections. Now, a big cliche about Africa would be, oh, you know, it's all patron, client, it's what who you know, you have to be in the right social network. And that's actually, you know, that's not wrong. Uh, but 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 look what Africans respond uh, to this. You know, it turns out that Africans are more likely than anybody else in the world to say uh, hard work brings a better life. Okay, if you look at the data, here we go. So this is just looking across different continents in the World Value Survey. 
okay? And here's, here's Africa, and here's, you know, this is one here, okay? So, so, so that the, if, you look across the, if you look across the figure, the, the height of the red column tells you, you know, tells you the proportion of Africans that give different answers. And you can see, you know, some Africans do say, you know, oh, it's all about luck and connections, but, but, but you know, that's only about four, five percent, five percent. But, but over a third say, no, 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 it's hard work. And, and that's actually more than anywhere, including uh, the United States. Okay, so so Africans think that you know hard work pays and you have to work hard in order to get ahead. Why is it that you know I'm not going to get into this too much? In in the paper we have a I didn't want to talk about that in such a short talk, but in the paper we discuss we present a sort of theoretical perspective on African society that kind of connects these three different arguments. So you know how could it be that there's this perception in Africa that, you know, you need to know the right people and everyone's sort of networks are very important. It's a kind of network based society. How could it be? How could that be true? But people still answer this. I, th I think I think that, you know, the way that Soren and I reconcile this is to say, yes, it's true. Your networks are important, but your networks are endogenous. You know, you can create networks, you make networks, you can. And people who have networks are always interested in talented people, people who can do things, people who can get things done, people with abilities. So, so there are networks, but it's not like the network of the British royal family, you know, it's, it's, it's something much more fluid and, and, and endogenous, you know, to use a piece of economics jargon. So that's, that's the way to think about that. Okay, so what sort of values do you want to inculcate in your children? Again, world value survey, independence, hard work, imaginations, feeling of responsibility. You know, this is a sort of reality check on that last question. So here's the percentage of people in different parts of the world who identify high, hard work as an important quality in your children. Again, Africa is, Africa is the top. So, 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 you know, so, so this is very surprising. It sort of suggests that underneath all of this, there's, there's all sorts of good habits and good norms and, in, in, and, and, and in Africa, which are, very synergetic with capitalist development in the same way that you have in, in China. Okay, let me not talk about that. There's too much evidence here. Okay, so let me, that's the first thing. Africa's achievement, African society is achievement-based. Here's the next one, what we call cosmopolitanism. You know, so this is, I've been doing some work, uh, Andrilla, Andrilla Dubé and I, who's uh, one of my colleagues at the Harris School, uh, who you'll meet, and the Pearson Institute, if you come, uh, Professor Dubé and I have been doing this research in, in central Nigeria on, on trying to understand uh, this conflict between farmers and herders. And so we actually did, we went and did some field work on the Jos Plateau in Plateau State. And I, I've been sort of reading about the history of, of, of that part of Nigeria. And, you know, here's a, this is, this is the sort of first ethnographic, it's not a, that's not a word I like, but, but it's the first but I, I don't have a substitute for it. It's called an anthropological map of Plateau Province by Mr. Ames in the Gazetteer of Plateau Province, 1934. And he identified 68 different societies on the plateau. So this is, a, this is an area of Nigeria, it's beautiful. It's about the size of uh, greater you know, metropolitan Chicago with 68 different polities living on it. You know, I said there were thousands of polities at the time of the scramble for Africa. And here they are, you know, here's the Ron and the Gashit and the Rop and the Gindiri and the Porom and the, you know, the Birom and the Nunku and the Wana. And, you know, so just give you a flavor from some research we're doing of just the kind of staggering heterogeneity of African society. And I, I always think like this is one of the things that I've enjoy, I enjoy so much about Africa. There's just so much variation and diversity. You know, that's this is where humans started after all. So, so, so there's been a longer time to develop different cultural ideas and different models of society. It's like a nonstop natural experiment doing research in Africa. And, and you know, just to give you a sense of, of just, you know, this is one of the reasons it's so exciting to work in Africa, I've, I've always thought personally. And, and you know, and so what are, what are the consequences of that? Well, one of them is multilingualism. OK, so if you look in the data, you know, uh, what's the proportion of people who's in Africa who speak one language? It's only one language. You know, it's about it's it's about 30 percent. 
what's the proportion of people that only speak one language in the US? It's over 75%. Okay, so the US is a, England worse, probably worse, you know, so the US is a very monolingual society. You know, European Union is, 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 is different, you know, there's, it's more multilingual than the US, but much less so than Africa. Okay, so, so, so Africa is very uh, multilingual and you know my my view I, we talk about this social I won't talk about start talking about the social psychology we talk about it in the paper but 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 to me this is an advantage you know I've always just been so impressed in Africa when you kind of work with someone and they speak five languages and and the way that they use that and the way they interact with different people and um okay uh I won't talk about that either let me just talk about let me just talk about one that's there's you know we look about we look at toleration you know toleration is also very interesting you know to what extent you'd think that if Africans were cosmopolitan it manifests itself in toleration of others and that's true okay but here's a fact that you probably don't know you know which is Africans' attitudes towards uh, foreigners uh, this is a this is a great metaphor. Uh, uh, originally from the historian John Eilif about, you know, what's the difference between Africa and Eurasia? Well, Eurasia is sort of like the chess set on the left. You know, this is the Lewis chess set in the British Museum, if you've ever been in the British Museum. And uh, what happens in chess? You know, in chess, you kind of obliterate, you, uh, sorry. Okay, sorry, my Congolese ringtone. Okay, in chess, what do you do? You know, you obliterate the opposition. Right, you you know you knock the other people off the board, and you know you take the king and the queen, and the... on the right is Mankala. It's called Mankala in East Africa. It's a game that's played all over Africa. So so you know you play it with these beans. What do you do in Mankala? You don't obliterate the opposition. You bring them into your, your team. Okay, that's a sort of metaphor, you know, for why Africa is different from the rest of the world. You know, you want people. You know, you want people, and and. One thing that's sort of fascinating, we, we have a much more detailed discussion of this in the paper, is that, you know, one way this manifests itself is in immense kind of hospitality in traditional African society. And in fact, it turns out in most African languages, the word for stranger and guest and foreigner are all the same. It's the same word. You know, it, it, it all comes up in proverbs all the time as well that we talk a little bit about the paper. So, so stranger and guest and foreigner it's the same word you know a stranger is a is a guest you know so this is something i experienced personally in sort of sierra leone uh that you know i i'd, I'd read all these things about you know conflict and the civil war when i first started working in sierra leone and th then i was always bemused you know by by in fact when i came instead of hostility, you know, to, towards strangers, everyone said, no, 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 yes, no, we, we want people to come, we need people to farm, we want people, you know, like, you should come, you can come, come farm, we'll find you, you know, like, we'll make you a house, and there's just incredible hospitality. Now, you might think, I'm okay, so I'm a white guy, you know, so that maybe that's not so representative of what, how Africans function, but, but I think it is actually, you know, and here it comes up in the language, you know, which is, okay, so here's Yoruba from the south of Nigeria, for example, same word, Hausa from the north of Nigeria, same word. It's not true everywhere, uh, but uh, it doesn't work in Afrikaans, you know. Afrikaans is a, a African language, actually. You know, Afrikaans developed primarily in the 19th century in Southern Africa as a way of creating a new identity uh, amongst uh, primarily white people, though many people speak Afrikaans, especially in the Cape province. So, so even non-white people. So, so, but you know, what's interesting, so we've been sort of doing this on a big scale now, is that outside of Africa, we've only found one language for which the word stranger, guest, and foreigner are the, sa are the same, which is Hawaiian, interestingly, which is a kind of, you know, it's a Polynesian language who would have who would have known so so this is you know there's a lot more in the paper too kinship systems are interesting but uh, let me say nothing about that let me just say let me just say i should shut up very soon so let me just sort of talk a little bit about this skepticism of power you know there's um i talked a little bit about you know the u.s founding fathers you know it's 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 very interesting you know even in in you know, I, I did, a, I've done a lot of work in uh, the Congo for the last 10 years. And one of the academic papers that I wrote and, and with colleagues of mine and we published 
was was kind of looking at the history of the so-called Kuba Kingdom, which was a which was a very elaborate pre-colonial state in 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 the south of the DRC, what's now Kasai. Uh, and and you know we 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 exploited the oral we 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 exploited the oral history of the Kuba and surrounding groups as a sort of natural experiment. And you know the 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 Kuba Kingdom was founded in the 17th century by by a, a king called Xi'an, who was a sort of political innovator. Uh, he comes in the oral history, or he arises with tobacco and chili peppers. So this is obviously connected to the Atlantic trade and social innovations like circumcision. But what's interesting is that even like someone like that, who in the US is like George Washington or something, you know, it'd be a kind of heroic state builder or Abraham Lincoln or whoever, you know, or England, it would be, you know, I don't know in England, you know, I don't know, Winston Churchill or whatever, you know, like, it's very morally ambiguous. In fact, the way in the end that King Xi'an becomes, you know, he unites these clans into a larger kingdom is they're gonna have a competition to decide who should be the king at a lake called Yu. And what they do is they have to make a hammer of copper and then they throw them into the lake and whoever's hammer floats wins, okay? So what does Xi'an do? He cheats, he makes a hammer out of balsa wood and he kind of puts a very thin, you know, kind of foil of copper on top and he throws his hammer and it floats, but he cheated. Come on, he cheated. Did George Washington or Abraham Lincoln cheat? You know, so, so even kind of successful political entrepreneurs in Africa have this, you know, there's this aura of like, you know, they're morally ambiguous. That's what I want to say, you know, so, 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 so yeah, he's the king, but, you know, he sort of cheated, you know, so, so, so that, so, you know, I talked about Redeemers. It's a very interesting book. So how would I know this? Again, we could look at the World Value Survey, different types of barometers. What you see is, you know, what you see in this data is, maybe I talked too much about this. So it is, you know, you see a lot of skepticism towards leaders. You see a lot of skepticism towards, you know, people are opposed to autocratic rule. They're opposed to dismantling checks and balances, much more so than in uh, Asia, particularly East Asia, for example. It looks much more like this Western tradition. I don't think there's much Western about many kind of traditions in Africa, but this aspect of it looks much more like this skeptical Western tradition from John Locke and Montesquieu and Madison and all these people. Okay, so in the paper, we look much more into this because in some sense, you know, the way we're thinking makes predictions about how different sorts of African society should think differently about authority. And so actually we kind of, we dive it down into, particularly in Nigeria, where, where it's sort of clearer to match these ideas onto these different societies, we actually test, look at some of the predictions at the kind of subnational level that different types of groups in Africa with different political philosophies or different political histories ought to have systematically different attitudes towards power and authority. And that's what we find. Okay, so, so let me, I'll conclude and people can ask questions, too much to talk about. Okay, and, and, and you know, one more thing also, yeah, I, I talked about that. I mean, I think the other thing which is very interesting is, is the whole, you know, connect talking to China, talking about China. I mean, again, I don't know exactly how to think about this, but, but you know, one thing you notice in, you know, this is something in Confucius, you know, in Confucius, it's all based on the family and your loyalty to the family is more important than your loyalty to kind of abstract principles, you know. So there's a famous bit also in Mengzi, Mencius, which sort of justifies patronage in some sense, you know, like you should love your brother, you know, like, isn't that more important than some notion of the rule of law or, so there's this emphasis on, you know, on your family. And that's also true, <laughs> that's true in Africa as well, you know. So the Chinese share many things in common philosophically, it seems to me, and in terms of political theory with Africans. And, 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 and that's interesting. I think that's interesting. That's something I'm trying to understand. And, and, you know, just to end by saying, you know, none of that means that these governance problems in Africa, they're there and they're, they're difficult to solve, you know, but are they more difficult to solve than the problem, problems that Deng Xiaoping solved in the 1970s? I, I, I don't know. You know, Deng Xiaoping had some advantages. You know, he had this more, he had a greater history of 
centralized political authority in China, you could say, and a greater history of bureaucratized state institutions. That's true, you know, but, but they'd also been, you know, but one could, we discussed that in the paper, you know, is it, is it true that De Deng Xiaoping solved a hard problem, but it's not clear to me that that's a harder problem to solve than, than what, what, that's an easier problem to solve than you have in Africa. Okay, all right, let, so let me, here, let me say the last bullet point here, which is that Africans' real assets are not gold, oil, copper. They're the people, you know, they're the people and the unique history in Africa, their attitudes, their culture, their creativity, their energy, you know, and that's, that's what this is about. All right, and now I'll shut up. You got the, you got the idea. Great, thank you so much. I see some hands raised. If you have any questions for Professor Robinson, feel free to raise your hand or send them in the chat. Um, so the first person I saw uh, with their hand raised is Mokhtar. Uh, thank you, Samantha. Uh, Professor Robinson, it's a pleasure to hear you speak and it's an honor to experience this. Um, I have two questions. My first one is there is usually uh, some economists and political theorists try to make an imaginary line between North Africa and the rest of Africa in respect to the formation of the state, how people view the state, and especially when you talk about the redeemer state with countries like Egypt looking at authoritarian governments as their savior, for example. So how would you say the ingredients for that path of a more uh, socially mobile society differ from North Africa and the rest of the continent. And my second question is, if you compare it to China, a lot of economists and political theorists said that with social mobility in China, um, you would have more of a liberal society and more accountable society that has not come to fruition. Do you think Africa will walk that Chinese path or will take the more narrow corridor, the shackled Leviathan uh, model that Europe and the West have taken. Yeah, so do I answer that now? Do I, shall I answer that? Yeah, so those are great questions. I mean, I think North Africa, you know, to me, uh, you know, to me, North Africa is sort of in this, it's, you know, it's common in this academic academia to talk about sub-Saharan Africa and like not include North Africa. And I think, you know, that's just, for the reason that somehow many aspects of North African society are kind of part of this Mediterranean world, which created a different dynamic historically. You know, just to give you an example of political institutions, you know, if you think about the kind of the state in Egypt and the class, you know, the sort of pharaonic classical Egypt, you know, the, and the state, they borrowed many ideas, you know, from, from, from Mesopotamia, from Persia, you know, the, the language, you know, the writing, was the, not the language, but the writing was borrowed from Mesopotamia. It was sort of massively adapted to the Egyptian context, but notions of sort of kingship and authority were, you know, were sort of adapted and borrowed. And I think, I think that's, you know, that's not something you see elsewhere in sub-Saharan Africa. So, so I think, I would sort of think of, I mean, I think that these are all important questions, but I guess the way I tend to think about it is that that's a sort of different cultural and historical world. And I don't know to what extent that the mechanisms I'm talking about apply, uh, uh, apply there. Although, you know, if you read Gel Gelner's book, you know, about Saints of the Atlases, Saints of the Atlas, which is about, you know, traditional Berber society in the Atlas Mountains, you know, that, that's, a, that's a very kind of decentralized political system, you know, which looks very similar to many types of decentralized political systems in sub-Saharan Africa. So obviously there are connections and there's trade. And, you know, if you read, you know, Sunjata, which is the oral history of the Mali empire, you know, that's when does that state formation happen? When, 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 when the people come with the book, you know, who are imams who come from the Arabian Peninsula, who bring Islam, and, you know, they kind of form a coalition with Sunjata. So, so I think that whole Islamic tradition is incredibly important in, in, in Africa. And, and but, but I don't know, that's beyond, it's a good question, but I think it's beyond the scope of what I can understand at the moment. I think in China, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'm talking, I, you know, I, I, I think that this social mobility I'm talking about or meritocracy has been combined for two and a half thousand years with what Westerners would call an illiberal political system. So 
I don't expect that to change anytime soon. I think this idea that somehow 50 years of economic growth is going to turn China into something completely different flies in the face of everything we know about Chinese history. You know, this Chinese system has been incredibly stable for a long time. You know, there's a very elaborate philosophy and, and, and they've combined, they've combined this meritocracy with this much more autocratic, very non-Western type of political system. So I think, I think, you know, people in the West just have to respect <laughs> that different parts of the world have different ideas about how politics and society can be organized and stop trying to pretend, you know, one of the problems with social theory is that most social theory is sort of incredibly calibrated to this, to sort of an interpretation of Western political and economic development. But the, you know, one thing I've learned working in Africa for 25 years is that that doesn't get you anywhere thinking about African history and African society. And actually one of the points in the Professor Sanchez de la Sierra's and our, the course that we're teaching, which, which Alex mentioned, is that you know, we're trying to take African society on its own terms and sort of deprogram this, you know, this focus of like this imperialistic focus, you know, uh, so, 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 you know, and that definitely needs to happen with respect to China, China too. So, sorry, that was, I talked too much. We're going to run out of time. Yes. Great. Thanks. Um, and then I see Ahmed had a question. Yes. Uh, so two very quick questions. Uh, thank you for the, for the great talk. Um, the, the first question on the theoretical framework. So you talked about these assets. Um, I wonder if you, know, you also thought of any liabilities which uh, you know, impede, um, let's say populations to, to, uh, to reap uh, these assets. Uh, and the second question is, is more about, um, let's say the differences within, uh, within Africa um, I mean, if, if you look at how the nations, um, uh, African nations um, sort of vote in UN, um, let's say processes, they often vote as a bloc, but they're often also very quick to, uh, you know, go back into their own um, smaller blocks, uh, be it, you know, Portuguese oriented or, or French oriented. Um, so I wanted to see if, you know, how, how do you sort of reconcile that um, uh, in your analysis? Over. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, sure, there are liabilities. We talk a little bit about that, you know. I mean, there's there's work uh, by my um, by my former colleague, you know, and collaborator Nathan Nunn about, for example, the impact of slave trade, the slave trade on trust in Africa. You know, so he finds a correlation that parts of Africa which were more intensively slaved, you know, people trust each other less. You know, so so that you know, you could say that's a liability. I'm, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, I think. Trust is a very sort of Western obsession, you know, in the sense that this is a society of individuals, you know, and we're all out for number one. And, you know, of course, we need trust because, because otherwise, how does anything work? But African society is not like that. It's much more collectivist, you know, it's much less individualistic and much less materialistic. Uh, you know, look at the United States. It's like, we'd rather hundreds of thousands of people died of COVID than like sacrifice 5% of GDP by actually locking the country down. You know, why? Well, because if we don't go shopping, who are we? Like, what's, 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 that's the meaning of life. We go shopping. I shop, therefore I am. So, of course, we've got to keep the shot. Oh, a few hundred thousand people die of COVID. You know, okay, fine. Stuff happens, you know. So, so this is a very materialistic society. I don't want to put you off coming to Chicago. Chicago is a fabulous place, you know, but I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, so, so, so I, I you know, I think, I think, you know, so, so, there are other liabilities. You know, there's research on how this, this network nature of society places obligations on people. You know, if you become successful, you know, you have to you have to look after people. You have to redistribute to people. You have to. So I, I you know, I think those things. I agree with that, and they can be important. And and but I'm, we're trying to emphasize something different. You know, people tend to emphasize this. You know, people tend to discuss the heterogeneity in Africa as a drawback. But I've never seen it like that myself personally, you know, and I think most of the statistical work that finds it's a drawback is badly done in my personal opinion. So we're trying to emphasize something different, but of course, you know, the big picture is, yeah, we need to take that seriously as well. I, you know, there's lots of differences between different parts of Africa for sure. Yeah, there's, there's enormous heterogeneity within Africa. We try to give some flavor of that in the paper, but I can't do justice to it in half an hour. And you know, Africa is not a country, as they, as they say. You know, 
Uh, and and that's you know we have to take that you know that that is not taken seriously enough in terms of how we deal with Africa and how, you know how the foreign you know the whole aid industry for example develops some kind of you know it develops some sort of boilerplate intervention and Sierra Leone that's the same as the Eastern DRC you know and that's the same as Mozambique and it isn't you know and 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 you know you're you're pointing to some kind of particular mechanisms but you know we could talk more about that but I just want to sort of agree that there's all this heterogeneity and you know I'm talking about Africa on average using this Afrobarometer but of course you know if you wanted to delve into that there's a lot of heterogeneity even in social mobility you know in different parts of Africa like Mali is going to be very different from southern Nigeria for instance so agreed Great. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, so I saw Hershina had your hand raised. Yes, my apologies for not being able to turn my video on right now, but thank you so much, Dr. Robinson, for your talk. Um, you ended the talk saying that the real assets are really the people and not as much as the assets as gold and resources and so on. But I would like to argue and say it's both. And a big factor holding development back is less control on our own resources. So I was curious if you had done any research or you're thinking of doing any research on how external nations like China, Russia or Western nations are the ones very much so controlling resources right now and how African countries can move out of neocolonialism. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to say that, you know, like, I think that, you know, if you look at the experience of economic development in the last, you know, 200 years or whatever, there are places that had lots of resources, you know, uh, that did well. The United States had lots of resources, but natural resources are neither necessary nor sufficient for successful economic development. You know, South Korea didn't have any natural resources. Singapore didn't have any natural, Taiwan didn't, Mauritius didn't have any natural resources. So, so I don't think the fact that Africa does have resources is neither here nor there. That's, you know, it's all about the people and innovation and creativity. And, you know, if you have resources, fine, you know, you could use them or whatever, but, but, you know, you're right, of course, that there's all sorts of predatory behavior connected with natural resource uh, wealth today. Uh, you know, there's predatory mining companies, there's, you know, there's predatory foreign powers, uh, you know. Uh, what's, are they holding Africa back? I, I, I doubt it, you know. I, I think, you know, I mean, if you look, for example, at one of my favorite, you know, examples is if you look at the history of Botswana, for example, that Botswana is like one of the great African success stories. And they had all these diamonds, but they were absolutely at the time of independence, you know, beholden to De Beers Mining Company. You know, what did they do? You know, they hired British lawyers and they stood up to De Beers and they, organ they kind of built the state capacity necessary to deal with De Beers. And, and they got, they totally renegotiated their whole, all their contracts with De Beers. And so, so I think, you know, that's because, you know, I, won't, I can't go into it now. If you take my class, you'll learn about the history of Botswana. But, you know, that's because there really is a history of kind of state capacity and governance and innovation in Botswana that goes, you know, back into the middle of the 19th century. And so they were able to solve a lot of these governance problems in a way that they could get De Beers, you know, one of the most predatory <laughs> international mining companies, they could get De Beers under control. So I think if Botswana can get De Beers under control, anyone can, you know, Jekamin in Congo can get, you know, Freeport McMahon under control or Rio Tinto or whatever, you know. So, so I think that problem can be solved is my guess. Great, thank you. So I think we're out of time. Thank you so much, Professor Robinson, for your hour today. And thank you, Alex, for uh, joining us as well and sending some really great links in the chat. Um, and thank you to all the admits who are here this morning for joining us. Um, we have some additional great sessions for the rest of the day. Uh, Dr. Meltzer um, at, talking about health policy. And then later this evening, we have some diversity and inclusion sessions. So we hope to see you there. Uh, but yeah, thank you all. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Hope to see you all in September. And the post Zoom world starts, hopefully. <laughs> we're all hoping for, yes. Yes, hopefully. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye.